Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're glad that you're here today, if you're visiting with us today. We're glad you took the opportunity uh, to be a part of our assembly today and to join us at the table of Jesus. Uh, just a reminder that we'll have uh, Bible classes for all ages, 10 minutes after our assembly. Uh, also, this afternoon, beginning at 4 o'clock, we are having a fall festival, followed by a fifth Sunday singing and sandwich supper at 5.30. Uh, we have, we means Lisa, has decided uh, to move the fall festival inside. So uh, if you're doing a booth or an activity, just make sure you're here around 3.30, 3.45. Lisa will have no problem telling you what to do. So just ask me. She does it every day of the week. You know, so. Also, uh, for the, just for the sandwich supper tonight, bring sandwiches, chips, desserts, uh, mostly desserts. And... Uh, then we'll sing at 5.30. I'm sorry, it's one of those days. Uh, also, just a reminder that next Sunday, November the 5th, there's about 17 people in our church that have a birthday, but besides that, um, there is a luncheon next Sunday, first Sunday luncheon, and it is the end of daylight saving time. Now, you don't have to set your clocks up, if you, I mean back, if you don't want to. You can. I can call you at 2 a.m. and remind you if you would like, or you can just come here an hour earlier and hang out with me. So... That's next Sunday. We'll try to remember to put that in the blast, but that's next week. So. And we are glad that you're here today, uh, mostly because Jesus is here. And that gives us a chance to encounter Jesus uh, and his spirit. And Jesus has prepared a table and invites us to be a part of that so that we can come together and to remember who he is and who we are uh, in relationship to him. So we're glad that you're here. Warren's going to have our shepherd's prayer and Bryce will lead our worship. We are very glad that you're here today. It is so good to be in worship with our brothers and sisters on a Sunday morning. And um, unfortunately our sis for our sister Shirley Nauman, she had an accident in a parking lot yesterday and uh, her foot was injured, uh, so much so that she's in St. David South and is uh, facing surgery soon on her foot. So let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer now. Father God, you are the great and good creator of the heavens and the earth and everything that's in the earth, Father. Father, the, the earth just resounds with the, with the signs of your hand and your creation. Father, you have loved us and do love us, and we are grateful. And Father, we want to lift up to you many that, that need our prayers. We pray for our sister Shirley that her foot can be repaired, uh, that the surgery will go easily, that the uh, healing will go rapidly, and that she can soon regain the, the use of that foot and be here. And Father, for Amanda Rutherford, and Kyle Futrell that are facing surgery this week, we pray for blessings for them. We pray for quick and easy surgeries and, and, and easy healing. Uh, help them to feel good. Just bless them through their surgeries, Father. And then, Father, for Wayne and Barbara Duffner, Father, we pray that you will bless Wayne and heal him of the infection that he has so that he can go home and enjoy his home and be with, with Barbara, Father. Father, bless Barbara as she deals with this uh, almost seemingly hopeless situation of dealing with Wayne's uh, long-term injury, his, his debilitation. Just bless her, Father. And Father, we know there are some here with us this morning that, that have expressed, that have used the word hopeless about their situation and some others of our brothers and sisters. And Father, we pray for them. Father, help them to know that as long as they are centered on you and focused on you, that there is hope that things, things will be good, can be good. 
Father, for our brother Russell, uh, we pray that you will heal him of his kidney and heart issues. Help him as he deals with insurance issues and with scheduling appointments and, and getting medicines. Father, just bless Russell. And Father, for Paul Castelloni and Sarah Cruz, we are grateful, so grateful to you for successful surgeries and for healing. And we pray that you will continue to bless them as they get used to uh, different diets. Uh, bless them with things that they can eat and enjoy. Bless Jeff White. Bless him through his cataract surgery. Bless Sonny Wakefield's family, Father, as they deal with, with his passing. And Father, as we look out at our world, we see wars in progress, wars we know about, wars in the Ukraine, in the Middle East, even in Africa. And Father, we pray for peace. We pray for healing of the nations so that they can live in peace and so that people can be provided for, so that they can have shelter and food and transportation, Father. Father, but Father is so good to be here and worship to you. Bless us now, Father, as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. I love Yeah. 
praising my Savior all day long? That's my story? You look like you're asleep. Wake up. Wake up. I ought to make you all move to the front. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for being our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for being full of grace and truth and mercy. Thank you, Father, for the joy that we have to be here today. We ask, Father, that you be with our members that are hurting. Be with all of us, Father, to make us realize that it's wonderful to be alive. Thank you, Father, for each person here. Thank you for all the people that have gone before us to establish this church in this place. Father, we ask that you give us hope. Give us happiness and give us peace and joy and love. Give us patience, Father. We know that all these things come from you. Help us, Father, to truly believe that you are in us and working through us today in this place. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's all pray this prayer together.
if it's convenient for it, it's all stained. And the main stained for the distributed as follows. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your heel and you will strike his head, his heel, excuse me, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. 
To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. I'm glad Glenn and flipped that around. That would have greatly changed my sermon today. <laughs> so over uh, my time in ministry, I've had several occasions when people will come really upset and distraught and seeking help for someone else. And that someone else is typically a loved one or a close friend whose life's kind of gone off the rail maybe at their own bad decisions or their own self-destructiveness, maybe just because of life circumstances. And, you know, sometimes, as Warren mentioned in his prayer, life gets pretty hard and hopelessness sets in. And, and, and the idea is to intervene, to come set up a meeting and maybe under just some normal pretense. And then when the meeting happens, address the issue the problem or the circumstance and it's been my experience that mostly interventions don't work people aren't going to be helped till they want to be helped and forcing that will actually cause more alienation and maybe even further destruction so uh, the next time you want me to intervene for you uh, just come on and we'll talk about it but uh, and my, my optimism is not high on intervention. Uh, even it's, if we think it's needed, it's, it's really difficult to make people do something, right? So I think about us and humanity and the story of creation and, and how Genesis presents those first three chapters of our early history as humans. Uh, we might, and these are not my words, I borrowed these from Walter Brueggemann, who is an Old Testament scholar. Three words can describe our early relationship uh, with creation and, and God. And the first is vocation. This is in Genesis 2.15. So God creates humanity and gives humanity something to do. Uh, and the, it's a pretty broad brush, something to do. Take care of the garden. Watch over it, pay attention to it. Not a lot of details, not a lot of micromanagement on God's part. Just go take care of the stuff, right? That's vocation. The second word you find in Genesis 2.16, and that's permission. There's all this stuff, right? An overabundance of resource. Go use it. Again, not a lot of detail on how and what you got to do and when you got to do it. Just it's your, at your disposal, uh, to have dominion over all the stuff and as you're taking care of it use it not only for the necessities of life but have a little fun with it okay it's all right you know fun's not a sin fun can be sinful but fun in itself is not a sin and then the third word that, that describes our early relationship is prohibition and that's in genesis 2 17 when God said, yeah, you can have everything you want except, right, the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And God then says there was a penalty for not, uh, you know, obeying the prohibition, and that penalty was death. I would suggest that that was not a threat. What that was was a reality of what happens when we ignore God's original pretense and, and how he set it up. And that is vocation and permission and prohibition as long as we trust God, then everything in the garden is good, right? So what could go wrong? I would suggest to you one letter went wrong. We'll get to that in a minute. And so in, in, the, in the garden, when the serpent shows up 
And, you know, Adam and Eve are frolicking around and observing how nice things are and living that good life of vocation and permission and prohibition. And they come to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know what the serpent says? He says, you know what? That prohibition is really just an option. After all, you have free will. Why don't you exercise it? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We've been given permission. We can think by ourselves. We're smart people, right? Oh, I didn't get an affirmation on that, so let me in. It's troubling. So. I mean, we have this ability to discern things and the serpent says, you know what? God's trying to limit you. That prohibition, which was supposed to protect you, is holding you down. You need to explore that. Right? And you need to become, if I can use a phrase, you need to become the captain of your own ship. You don't need people telling you what to do. And when the serpent presents the prohibition as an option, that one-letter problem shows up in Genesis 3. And that one-letter problem is I. There's a lot of I statements in Genesis 3 after the fruit is consumed. And so what happens to me in Genesis 3 is, is the serpent opens up a theological discussion. Kind of weird to think that the serpent's the first theologian, isn't it? Because theology just means to think about or talk about God. And that's what the serpent's kind of doing, talking about God. But what the serpent does in this theological discussion is kind of, let's push God to the background a minute. Let's talk about us, can we? Let's just talk about you and me. Yeah, you know, we know God's here. But what about us? What about us? And the theological discussion then, as, was, as I mentioned earlier, it begins to talk about, you know, what's the real good life here? Yeah, you got everything, but, right? But. Because, you know, that tree, that tree, and that fruit on that tree, that's the key to the good life. That's the key to being, if I can use a modern sociological term, that's the key to being an independent, autonomous self. You write your own story. Now, don't let God hold you back, because that's what God's trying to do. God's trying to hold you back. God's afraid of you. God's afraid of you. As the discussion goes on, if you'll just eat of it, you'll become wise you'll be like God you'll see things differently you'll be able to say you know what God now that I know what you're about I don't need you anymore I'll eat what I want to eat I'll go where I want to go I'll do what I want to do sounds pretty good right I mean we have a hard time, don't we? We have a hard time with people telling us what we should or shouldn't do, don't we? That's why interventions don't work. We don't like to hear what we ought to do. One of, one of my just pet peeve phrases is, is that phrase. You know what you ought to do? Not listen to you. That's what I ought to do. Right. And you know what? In, in, in the first couple's mind in the garden, as the serpent makes this theological argument, which really says you don't need God, at the bottom of that, you don't need God, you've got you, what else do you need? At the bottom of that argument is, is that discussion, is that, you know what? I don't want somebody to tell me what I ought to do. I know what I ought to do. And you know what happens as the serpent makes that theological point? 
that that prohibition isn't really true. God's not going to kill you. You're going to be better off. You're going to see the world differently. You're going to be in charge of yourself. What happened? That couple was looking to learn to be shrewd or wise. You know what they discovered? They were nude. They saw a mirror for the first time, right? So to speak. And isn't it interesting what they do? Before God ever shows up again, or before God says anything, you know what shows up first? Guilt. They go and hide, right? And guilt is so destructive, isn't it? You know what guilt says? I don't trust God. Guilt's not just, I made a mistake. Guilt says, I don't trust that God can take care of that. So they go, you know, hide and really make bad clothing, apparently. (laughs) Guilt is so destructive because you know what guilt does is guilt begins to alienate. It alienates us from God. We don't want to either face God or we don't trust God or we don't think we're worthy of God's grace. And so what do we do? We just push God aside as if God doesn't exist. And guilt also alienates us from creation. That very creation that God gave this permissive authority to have dominion over. And guilt causes tension and alienates us from each other. It is so destructive. All we want to be is our own people, right? In charge of our own self. Not have anybody tell us to do Just let us go live life the way we want to live life and everything's going to be okay except when it's not. And so God pronounces a curse. We call it a curse. And if you think about that curse, uh, I would suggest to you one, that curse is descriptive, not prescriptive. This is the way things are, not how God wants them to be. But that curse, you see the tension that guilt brings and the curse brings, the tension between us as humanity and creation. You know what we have to put up with? We have to put up with 80 degrees one day and 40 degrees the next. We have to navigate periods of drought followed by periods of flood. You know what, we can't control nature. We can't even predict it. We try to. We can't. We're at odds with the whole creation now. At one time, we weren't, right? It worked. No tornadoes, no hurricanes, no floods, no droughts, uh, no you know, bipolar temperature changes. Good. And we're also in tension with critters. Chris and I were out last night because it was a lovely night and uh, just hanging out, you know, in the backyard and 30 minutes later, I got mosquito whelps everywhere. (laughs) Thanks, Adam. I don't like snakes, do you? I know there's good snakes. You know, the only good snake in Greg's world is one with its head chopped off. Uh... I have a daughter who is deathly afraid of spiders. We have to deal with critters, don't we? Anybody ever hit a deer? Yeah, I was hit one time by an uninsured deer. It was uh, terrible. (laughs) Anybody ever have a skunk in their yard? Yeah. Again, thanks, Adam. Thanks us, because you know what happened behind all that? I want to be in charge. And so we're at tension with creation or with the serpent. We're also at tension with God. We get mad at God, we doubt God, we curse God, we ignore God, we limit God. Right? Do that. And we have this tension, you know, just with ourselves and trying to stay alive. At one point, you know, 
apparently the fish just jumped out of the sea into your frying pan. And guess what we have to do now? All right, for those of the, I know a lot of you are retired, but when you were working, did you ever go a year without a stressful day? Have you ever gone a year without feeling anxious? When you watch the market, do you feel, do you feel really good about your investments? Yeah, you did today, but what about tomorrow, right? Just the very fact that we try to stay alive, right? There's tension and there's stress. And God said for Adam, right, it was going to be, you're going to have to work. Work's not a bad word, but what the kind of work he's doing is stressful and it's full of anxiety and it's full of toil. And you never know, am I going to have enough? Is it going to work out, right? Am I going to run out of money before I run out of month? All that stuff factors in, doesn't it? You know why? Because we want to be in charge of us. And then there's tension between males and females. I know that none of you married couples have ever had a stress-filled day in your life, right? You know, I do these pre-marriage things, uh, and I'm the least qualified person <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Gender tension happens in the garden. And you know what? It's behind all that in that tension is somebody wants to dominate the other person and the other person wants to make sure they're not dominated. And so what do we do? We fight and we bow up and we manipulate and we play these passive aggressive games. We do all the stuff that is absolutely detrimental to relationships. Thanks, Adam and Eve. Again, God pronounces a curse and although it's punitive, it's also redemptive. God doesn't want it to be that way. That's not how it was. Because God had this plan. If we'll just trust God and get out of God's way, we'll understand what the good life is. But you know what the problem with us and the good life is? Is the good life is never seems to be good enough. When's the last time you thought, you know what, I'm going to go take a job so I can have less money? Somebody accused me of that one time about moving. I noticed you've never moved to a position where you took less money. Yeah, that's probably true. Right. It's probably true. We always want more. We want something better, don't we? We want emblems on our shirts and our clothes and on our cars and a better address and better food and whatever it is. In and of itself, listen, I, I, their ambition has its place, but selfish ambition means that you trust yourself more than God. Isn't that what the couple does? When they decide that the prohibition is an option, it's a chance to exercise free will. It's a chance to say, you know what? Now that I have knowledge, I don't need God anymore. It sounds like humanity needs an intervention, doesn't it? I'm so grateful that God at God's core is life-giving, not life-taking. Aren't you? Because what happens with that eye problem and wanting to be the captain of your own ship and set your own course and live the life you're, the way you want to is eventually our desire will turn into sin. And sin's only wage is death. But God is life-giving, not life-taking. You know what God recognized? That humanity needs an intervention. Whether you ask for it or not, humanity needs an intervention. So again, while the curse seems very punitive, the curse is also redemptive and restorative. That whole passage about he'll bruise your heel but you'll bruise his head is very messianic in its essence. That Jesus is going to be the head crusher for us. Jesus is going to intervene on our behalf. You know, Paul said it this way in Romans 5 and verse 8, and I'll paraphrase. When we're at our worst, God is at his best. While we were still sinners, 
before we got it right, before we figured it out, before we put away selfishness, before that, Christ died for us. Now that's hopeful, church. That's hopeful. Because I know this, we can get our lives off the rails in a hurry. I mean, one bad decision, and it can go places we never thought, right? One defiant act, and we'll end up in places that we never thought we would be. One word, and we end up with relationships broken. Here's the deal. God's grace is bigger than that. The Messiah, the Savior, came to destroy that and to overcome that. And so while, yes, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we understand that. We also understand this, that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Sometimes we need an intervention. And you know what? In this case, in this case, the intervention works. That's what a Messiah does. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus who overcomes our selfishness and sinfulness in spite of us. We pray, Father, that we would allow him to intervene on our behalf, that we would accept his grace, and that we would recognize that your grace is bigger than all our sin. Father, defeat within us that desire to be so independent Help us, Father, to learn to be dependent upon you for everything. And as we do that, to be appreciative of everything that you give us. We're grateful, Father, that you give us breath and you give us life and that you give us hope through Jesus. May we never forget that. It's through him we pray. Amen. And we are messy, aren't we? <laughs> we are just messy. And God cleans up our mess, and that's what Jesus came to do, right? To redeem us and to buy us back from the messiness of sin and to buy us back from the penalty of death and to offer himself as a sacrifice so that we could live. Uh, he is the great snake killer, right? And I think if we recognize that, church, we put Jesus in the right perspective, We'll understand how much we need God and how much we depend on God and how much we have to have Jesus as our Savior because we cannot save ourselves. And so this morning, that I problem that we sometimes have, Jesus is bigger than that too. And the key to that is to deny that I problem, deny self, to recognize and depend on him and trust that he is the Savior and accept his grace and die, be cleansed in, in the waters of baptism, receive Jesus' the spirit and see life differently. Actually, you can see it very optimistically like it was in the beginning because that's what God's doing. He's redeeming creation to get back to the way it was, not the way it is. And I think the first step is for us to be in a relationship with Jesus. So that opportunity is yours this morning. Yeah, if you need uh, to put your Lord on and baptism, that opportunity is yours. If you need help, prayers, and life's got hard, and we're here for each other. And part of what, you know, Jesus' love does is overcome that guilt and that alienation that comes from that. We want to help and walk with you. So our elders are going to be at the back this morning. Uh, if there's something that we can help you with, please see one of them. Let's stand and sing.
remembrance. It was a four day business trip, uh, bags were packed. My work files in my backpack were set, left the house with plenty of time to get parked, uh, get through security, and with plenty of time to spare. Sorted through all the coming day schedule of this meetings and the contacts that we're gonna make and, and certainly double checking the reservation, meals set along with transportation for clients. The flight was good. Luggage arrived, transportation from the airport to the hotel without incident. All was going just as expected. For as you see, I have done this a hundred times. A hundred times before. So it was nothing unusual. From the preparation to the execution, this was a regiment that was very routine. And as for this particular trip, seemingly flawless, yet there was something I failed to remember. I think for us, remembering, and I'm saying always remembering, is a challenge. And for me at this point in this trip, all aspects were executed just as I had done so many times before. So reaching my hotel room, I began the routine of sorting out my belongings and preparing for the evening's activities. And it was at that point I discovered I had packed everything except pants. <laughs> plenty of shirts, plenty of socks, shoes, belts, I had everything, everything but pants. Some might say that one's memory goes as you get older, and I'm not so sure that that is completely true as it's our ability to remember things. Or, or to put it another way, the ability uh, to forget things is often evident regardless of, of age. I think we're easily distracted and we often are self-absorbed and, and life presents us challenges physically, emotionally, and spiritually, whatever the, the source of reasoning, the weight of life shifts our focus, causing us to have difficulty remembering things, whether it's the small things, where the keys, the phone, where we parked our car, perhaps the important things, birthdays, anniversaries, perhaps something Jesus said or did. We sometimes simply fail to remember. Perhaps that is why Jesus brings us to the table so that we can remember. We can remember what is important. We can remember that those sitting around us are our family in Christ. So that we can remember that the very breath we breathe at this moment is because of his grace and mercy. We're reminded that as we come to this table together, we all proclaim that Jesus is Lord and is King who gave himself up for you and me, and he was raised from the dead. In Luke chapter 22, when the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now, from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to him, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Holy and merciful Father, you are the creator of heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Oh God, you alone are worthy to be praised. Father, we join together in one voice to praise you. We offer you our praise and our thanks for your unfailing love and mercy. Fathers, we join together this morning and we break this bread together to remember and to give thanks. 
we pray you'll bless us, that you will help us remember. We give thanks to you, Father, for our Savior and King Jesus, who has offered himself up for us as an offering to you so that we might be bought, we might be rescued from the power of darkness. Through your power, Jesus, Father, was raised from the dead, and we proclaim that, and we share in his resurrection. We are presented to you through his blood and his body, holy, blameless, which is all through your power, grace, and love. Father, may we always remember. All praise be to you and to our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As I see Jesus take the bread and give thanks, I'm reminded of the times where he would take the bread and break it and give thanks. The road to Emmaus after his resurrection, it was how he was remembered. They recognized him because he took the bread and he broke it and he uh, gave thanks. Remember when he fed the 5,000. I remember his compassion for the people Jesus brings us to his table to remember, to offer thanks. I think this week we, we will have a meal or two. Probably each day we'll have a meal or two. Perhaps when we break bread this week, we will be reminded of Jesus. We, we will be reminded of the great love Jesus had for us. Reminded that he provides for us each day. Continuing in Luke. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, this, is, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's pray. Holy and merciful Father, we lift these cups acknowledging that Jesus is our Savior, who you raised from the dead. His blood covers us and brings us to you, Father. We celebrate together the gift of our deliverance and inclusion into the kingdom. You have done for us, Father, what we could never do for ourselves, and you have given us the resurrection. Father, our hope and our lives rest in you. Amen. Life gets busy. It presents us with many challenges. Our responsibilities and events that fill our days often place the focus on ourselves. And you know, I pray that, that this reminder of Jesus will carry through each moment this week so that each of us are reminded to serve others and to care for those that we meet. Find ways to love more fully those that God places near us. Take those, um, well, that, that we take up those opportunities to serve others and to meet needs of others. For you see, I think these offerings of self-sacrifice are part of our, our daily worship. So perhaps as we break bread, as we break for a meal each, each day, that we permit that those moments serve as a, rem a time for, for remembrance and, rem and a reminder of him, a reminder of his love, 
and the joy that we share as a part of his kingdom. So we offer this prayer for those offerings that, that we will soon uh, offer. Holy and sovereign God, our Father, we rejoice in you. We rejoice in how you have sought us out and delivered us clean through the blood of Jesus. And through him, we come into your awesome presence. We ask you, O oh God, to bless us with moments of remembrance this week. That we remember Jesus and his service. And that instead of looking out so much for our own selves, we look out for the, for the needs of others and we bring those offerings to you. We give of ourselves, our time, and our, the money that you give us, the things that you give us. We ask, Father, that we will be filled with your grace and mercy and love, that we cannot help but to give grace and mercy and love to those you place in our path. May your will be done within us and within this community, Father. We give you the desires of our hearts and our minds and ask, Father, that you shape us and mold us, use us in your service. Give us eyes to see your will. Father, grant us the courage, the humility to fully depend on you. Through your power and grace and mercy, you bless us with peace and hope that is found only in your beloved son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Morning, church. It's great to see everyone today. And uh, I think back to last week, uh, Lance talked about smiling more and what have you. And I can say a while ago, when Bryce stopped us and, and we kind of rebooted a while ago, there was a change. It makes a difference. And so uh, one of the, the words that I like to think of is, uh, well, I, I think maybe perspective is where I'm going to try to go. Uh, but one of my favorite words is opportunity. 
Because opportunity represents a chance. Uh, and then reframing. Sometimes we have to take things that maybe they don't seem just as we would like them, or maybe they're even negative. But if we can take and change the way we look at that, in effect, change the frame, we can make the whole picture look different. And I think those are skills that are good for us because it allows for us to, to have that better perspective. You know, while uh, Chris brought up airports, I'm thinking about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, we were delayed on a flight. Uh, and so I found myself, uh, I'm gonna have to run from Terminal B to Terminal A at Chicago Midway to try to beat that door closing on the airplane, you know, 10 minutes before you take off. And while Midway's not a huge airport, it was farther than I was prepared to run. I've got my backpack on, and we knew ahead of time, we knew ahead of time that this was gonna be really close. We might not make it. And if that were the case, I might not get to Cancun for two more days. And so the lady in Austin, she, uh, and don't ask me why we flew to Chicago to get to Mexico, I know. But, <laughs> see there we can smile about those things, you know, because they represent opportunity. But uh, what it amounts to is uh, the lady in Austin, she was thinking ahead. She said, okay, I'm gonna let you pre-board so you can ride on the front row and you don't have to wait to get off the plane and, you know, with other people. And there were four of us in this circumstance. And so I take off running. And I've got the juices flowing and I'm excited and, you know, it's kind of like, can I do this? And about halfway through, I drug my toe and I fell. <laughs> there were about four or five people just, oh, are you all right? Can I help you? And I said, man, I've got to get up and get going. <laughs> and I did. And we made it. I was out of breath. I thought I was about to have a heart attack. <laughs> but we made it. And so I think sometimes, you know, the, the perspective that we have is so important because that's what allows us to make it through tough times. If we see things in such a negative way or in such a uh, uh, pessimistic way, then it really, it really hurts the journey. And so I would encourage you, you know, as we work to smile, as we work to uh, seek opportunity, chances to make a difference, chances to love, chances to uh, make a difference for other people, let's don't miss out on those opportunities. I was struck by several people today that wish me the best because of the surgery tomorrow. And those things mean a lot. Don't ever underestimate the fact that you can impact the way others feel by simply smiling, by simply reaching out to them, and in effect saying, I love you. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this family. It's made up of such a group of people that are so loving and kind and thoughtful. Help us always to see opportunity to make a difference, to glorify you because of the way that we uh, treat each other, because of the way we love each other, and in doing so, express our love to you. Father, thank you for blessing us so richly. Thank you for for loving us and for the gift of your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.